Welcome back everyone. I hope that you've had a nice break with your family, that you've been able to discuss some of the things that you learned this morning, and most importantly, that you got something to eat. If we haven't met before, my name is Tara Bentley and I am the Executive Director for the Indiana Association of Home Educators, also known as the IAHE, and I'm very glad that you're with us today. We had a lot of great information for you this morning, and we've got even more coming up. If you weren't with us this morning, you'll be able to go back and watch the content at your leisure whenever you want. This afternoon, we've got great speakers and a lot of great information. But before we get started, I'm going to tell you another little secret. This morning, I shared with you the fact that Hey, I'm not in Indiana. I'm here in Florida enjoying the IAHE Virtual Homeschool Day at the Capitol. So now that I've told you one little secret, let me tell you another one. For many, many years as a homeschool parent, I took the freedom that we have here in Indiana for granted. I didn't realize how great we had it. Indiana has some of the best homeschool laws in the country, and it's all because families were vigilant because they watched the dangers to homeschool freedom. And the IAHE has been here in our state since 1983, making sure that your freedom is not taken away from you. Our speakers today are going to tell you a lot more about it. And if you're like me and you just didn't know, today's a great day to learn more. Well, hello from warm, sunny Arizona. Uh, my name is Allison Gentala, and I am the Director of Government Affairs for Arizona Families for Home Education. And I am honored to be here with you today for your online capital event there in Indiana. Uh, I hope you enjoy your day. I hope you learn all kinds of new things about getting involved in civics and how policy works and how policy is made and, and that you have a, a great time uh, through learning. So um, I know this year has been really unprecedented with the changes we've had to make and the new things we've had to learn, even homeschool moms, right? We've all had to learn new things. Uh, we're learning how to use Zoom maybe for the first time how to um, remember to unmute our mic button or turn on our screen and uh, just all kinds of learning happening. Um, your legislators are also learning all kinds of new things. Here in Arizona, our legislators are holding all of their committee hearings um, online so you, we can log on and watch those and all the testimony is happening via Zoom. So lots of new learning for your legislators as well as you. Um, with that in mind and all the new things, I know many capitals are not open for people to come in and watch. I wanted to leave you with six ways that you can talk to and connect with and get to know your legislators even during the coronavirus pandemic. So, um, First, I wanted to uh, talk about how to address your legislator. Uh, when I'm speaking with a legislator, I always use their official title, senator um, or representative, and that's just a, a form of respect, so we want to do that. Um, but as far as connecting with your legislator, first let me tell you, this is really important. It's important for us as homeschool families to get to know and connect with our legislators because it's important for them to understand who we are and what this is that we're doing and to understand how well we're doing and that our children are learning and growing and that our children are involved, that they volunteer within the community and so forth. So that the more you know your legislator, the, the more favorable view they're going to have of homeschool in general and us educating our children at home. The first way, and I think maybe the most dynamic way that you can connect with your legislator and talk to them is by having them come talk to you. Um, have your legislator out. If you have a co-op or a group, you can have your legislator come and speak to the children in your group or the teenagers and uh, they can talk about all kinds of things within the legislative process. Maybe have them talk on how a bill becomes a law 
or the history of your state. Or maybe have them share with the teenagers uh, their story, how it is that they decided to get involved in public service and, and, and how that has changed their lives. Uh, this is a really great way to interact because you get to talk to them face to face. Now granted, during coronavirus, we might have legislators who prefer to um, speak to your group via Zoom. Even so, there's a great opportunity to talk to them, to get to know them, and, and let them see what it is that homeschool is all about. And they, they usually are very willing to come and speak to your group. They're excited about the work they do, and they love to inspire young people to public service as well. So that's the first thing that you can do. Another, the second thing that I think is really important, a great way to connect, would be to volunteer on a legislator's campaign. So you can go down and look and see, I mean, well, once campaign season starts, you have signs all over the place, right? Find your legislators, find the ones that line up with your beliefs, especially if you are in their district, and go volunteer on their campaign. They can have, um, they, they need people helping them make phone calls and maybe go out. We've taken our children um, and done quite a few things over the years, go out and hammer up signs for their campaign, or maybe go door to door and, and ask people to vote for your candidate. Um, legislators love it when you come out and work for them. And once again, this is a way that legislators can get to know you, get to know your children and see, um, just how amazing homeschool families really are. So that would be the second way you can do that. The third way would be to um, look for your legislators at community events. They often attend community events, so go to your capital or legislative website, look up and find out who your legislators are. Uh, look at their picture so you know what they look like and then just keep an eye open for them. If you do see them at a public event, don't be shy about going up and saying, hi, this is who I am. We homeschool. Here's my children. Could we get a picture with you? I thank them for their service. You know, legislators and all elected officials sacrifice so very much in service to our state, as in this case with the legislators, or whether they're serving our country. Uh, they put themselves out there. They run a campaign. They have people digging into their past and saying things about them that may or may not be true. And they do that because they have a heart to serve. So be sure to thank them for their service when you do see them out and about. The fourth way that you can really connect with your legislator is to send a handwritten note. I would say a thank you note, thanking them for their service. But you know, legislators receive so many emails here in Arizona. We, um, I have heard from some of our legislators that they are receiving a thousand emails a day from people. Some of them might even share a, an administrative assistant. So if they're sharing an administrative assistant with another legislator, that assistant is going through 2,000 emails a day trying to prioritize and get the right emails to the legislator. But a handwritten note um, is, is really unique in this time period, right? When we all tend to do emails and do everything electronic. So send that handwritten note, thank them for their time, maybe include a picture of your family and, and tell them that you would love to meet them at some point. Um, I think that those handwritten notes, because they're so rare in our day and age, really stand out. Or the fifth way would be to have your children write a note. You know, legislators are people just like you and I, they think kids are cute. They love to see how children are learning, how they write cute little notes and letters. Have your children write a note. Thank them for their service. Maybe have your children watch a few minutes of a floor debate and then draw a picture about it or, or write a little bit about it. Or have your young child draw a picture of your state capitol building and mail that into the legislator. They would love to hear from you. And then you've got some rapport with them and you can see them later. If you see them, you can say, oh, we sent you that, that picture of the Capitol or the picture of your family. But um, that, that personal connection is so, so important and that your legislators get to know you, get to know your families and what it is that you do and get a better understanding of what homeschool is. And you know, legislators, uh, they're people just like us. They have parents and siblings and children and grandchildren maybe, 
and they have hobbies and things they love to do. So, um, you know, as you're getting to know your legislator, try to remember those special things. We have in Arizona, we have two different legislators who are gifted uh, musicians. And so at our Capitol Day, we're, we're still hoping that we're going to have that live event outside. It's going to be nice and warm out here. And um, we rarely have rain, so that's not too much of a problem. But we're going to have two of our legislators. We're going to ask them if they'd be willing to come out and lead the group in a couple of patriotic songs. Um, and, and that's a different kind of connection, just seeing them as a real human, someone who lives life just like we do. And, um, but, you know, uh, they are serving. So um, great to get to know them better and remember those things they do. And, and then you can even say, hey, my, my child plays the piano too. And, you, you know, build that rapport with them. Um, one last way that you could get to know your legislator better would be to schedule a meeting with them. You could call them up and say, hey, our family's gonna be taking a field trip. We're a homeschool family. We're going to be down at the Capitol. We'd really love to meet with you and get to know you. Um, sometimes this, this could be accomplished. I would say during the session, it's much more difficult because your legislators are so incredibly busy and they're working so many hours. Outside of the session, they have a little more time. So that would be a great time to go meet them, um, take them a nice thank you note, maybe a nice plate of homemade cookies, or um, you can have your child maybe even bring in a little project that they did in their homeschool and say, you know, look what I did. Um, legislators are people just like you and I. They love to hear from the people that live right in their district and they want to get to know you. So take that opportunity. Um, try out some of these things and see how well you can get to know your legislator in the next year. Um, I have so loved being with you. I hope that you have a fantastic capital day there in Indiana, and I hope that you learn lots and that you get involved. Thank you. Allison Slatter, and I am the Senior Policy Analyst for IHE and its sister organization, IHE Action. Our organizations have been serving homeschool families since 1983. While Indiana has always been a friendly state to homeschool in, we've seen a significant challenges to our ability to remain free in the recent years. As a matter of fact, we're among the top five states to homeschool in the, in the country. So that's a pretty important status to protect. And this year, the entire educational field has had to rethink learning. What does it mean to learn in a school with teachers? And also, what does it mean to learn with parents at home? The state of homeschooling in Indiana has also required our volunteers to step up and assist thousands of brand new home educators as they've decided to transition from public or private institutional schools into home education. So our volunteers have been busy making new contacts with new parents. They've been increased, there's been a ton of increase in monitoring and mediating social media as all these new members have questions. We are also busy with school administrators and other edu professional educators and teaching them about non-public, non-accredited laws and what that looks like as they interact with us. 
In fact, IHG several times has had to directly assist families as they've been trying to withdraw children from the school systems and helping them, helping the schools understand what the law says. So we've been pretty busy this year doing all of those fun things. And for many years now, IDOE has actually been publishing inaccurate information regarding our, our, our families and what our responsibilities are and what the law requires. So that's another thing that we've been active in doing. And one of the things that we've done is we've created a withdrawal letter that the families can download. They can insert their information, download it, print it, and send it to their schools so that they're, they already have the language ready to go. They don't have to reinvent the wheel. We've already done it for them. They just have to plug in the information. And we've also created a blog post that helps walk families through what their responsibilities are and what the requirements to homeschool are in the state of Indiana. And so far, it's been awfully successful, lots of traffic, lots of brand new families that we've been able to help. And I'm grateful for that being able to be part of that. IHG has also always heard from a handful of families who have had difficulty with drawing kids from their public schools. That's always happened. But this year, we have definitely hit a high watermark. I mean, we've had so many contacts from families where there have been difficulties. So because of that, we have an active communication with the Indiana Department of Education, individual school administrators, parents, and we've also been maintaining all of our relationships that we have with the other state um, agencies, as well as legislators. Especially, we had a, a great meeting with the new, newly installed Secretary of Education, Dr. Katie Jenner. Um, and as that we're looking at what's going on with the state, specifically legislation, uh, one bill of note is the one that Representative Timothy Wesco introduced, which is HB 1073. And really all it does is codify what's already law. So it puts it in the code, black and white, written out, doesn't do anything new. It just states that um, diplomas from non-public, non-accredited uh, schools with less than one employee, meaning homeschoolers, so if we're, we're less than one employee, that our diplomas count just like any other school's diploma that counts as we are, as our kids have completed what is required for of them for high school graduation. And really what this is going to do is help our Hoosier homeschoolers who then leave the nest, then they go into other states and maybe they wanna go into further uh, education or um, educational programs, or maybe they want to um, get a job and the job is requiring them to show proof of a high school diploma. Well, in other states that are, that are more strict, they may not understand a lot of our laws, but if we have our law codified as in, in the code that states that our our homeschool diplomas are equal to any other diploma that a child might receive, that gives them the footing to be able to say, see, my diploma is legal and valid and you should accept it. And that would hopefully cut off a lot of the homeschool discrimination that homeschoolers from the state of Indiana might see in other states where they require things like homeschool IDs or registration numbers or any of those other things that we are fortunate and blessed to not have in the state of Indiana. So there's that. Now, the thing with 1073, HB 1073, we do have some issues with some of the language. We would like to broaden it out, expand it so it's not just homeschoolers, but it's other schools like Christian private schools who have equally the same problem that we do with our diplomas. So this would just, if we can expand that out, that would make it great for them. And we also have some other language we'd like to see cut out because we don't think it's really uh, necessary and could open up a lot more, um, let's just say, uh, makes the government more inquiring into what we're doing now. It's not that it doesn't already happen. Uh, schools can already ask for transcripts and ask questions about the course courses that were taken. That's nothing new, but it doesn't need to be codified. I mean, if a school, if a parent refuses to give that kind of information, a school doesn't have to accept them. So that's kind of always been the case. There's no need to codify that uh, because it's always happened. Now, this bill is gonna be coming up for a vote and for the amendments on uh, Wednesday, February 10th. This is pre-recorded, so I'm not, I don't know what's gonna happen just yet. So towards the end of the week, we might have a whole lot more information for you on this particular bill, but this is one to watch. It could be good or it could be a problem. And either way, we will be monitoring it as it makes its through, way through the two chambers. Also in this new pandemic era, one of the things that we were very concerned about was whether or not um, homeschooling, or, well, the school choice lobbyists, whether or not they would be trying to enter uh, public funding into the homeschooling market. And unfortunately we, we, were, act, we were correct. And that is what's happening. So uh, there, we know that freedom is, fan, is great, 
But when we start adding choice, specifically choice that involves any kind of public money or taxpayer money, that's going to come at the loss of freedom and the loss of the things that we have heretofore and enjoyed in the state of Indiana. So there's two bills that would kind of head in that direction. And one is um, SB 412 and the and one in the House is HB 1005. Now, these bills only hit certain demographics. It's not for everyone everywhere, but it opens the door to um, for active military families, low income, special needs families, as well as foster families to be able to access public funds. Now, they don't exactly say homeschooling, but there's a lot of things that can cross over into it. And that's kind of the problem. Um, now, on the other hand, um, we're neutral on this bill because we recognize that parents are the best people to be in, in, uh, in control of their child's education and make those choices. So we understand that, but we also are very leery of the fact that this is coming with taxpayer money. And, you know, each bill, um, has their variations of what that means and what it looks like because one bill has military families, the other one doesn't. As it goes through the process, they'll start making amendments and making deals as to which, which language is going to win out. And so that's something we'll just have to keep moving and listening to and seeing what's happening as it, it, as it goes through. So, you know, as I said, we do believe in freedom. We do believe in liberty for education. Uh, but the thing is, is that, you know, the come, it does come at the cost of freedom and many seasoned home educators are not willing to make that trade. Why? Because they, they, they did the calculations. They looked at what their kids needed and, and recognized that, that schools and what they were going to require was not what was needed. So homeschooling parents that are accepting educational savings accounts or otherwise known as ESAs, they're going to be forced to be choosing between homeschool freedoms and their child's needs. And that's fact. So it brings with it unintended consequences that those on the outside of the homeschool world may not understand and they most certainly do not comprehend what could happen. ESAs are not a solution to the educational predicament the Indiana is currently in, and particularly for, for children, uh, parents of special learners. Indiana can do better for families of special needs and foster children, and we can and we should. IAG is taking, as I said, a neutral stance. We agree that this is a, um, that parents are in charge and they should be in charge. But the problem we have with these particular bills, these particular bills open the door to expanding education, education dollars, specifically public dollars, and all the regulations that go along with public dollars into the new market of home education. And that is a concern to us. As an organization, we've seen many attempts across the state, across all of the states to expand school choice, specifically using public dollars in that attempt. And what we have consistently seen is poor results and patterns of fraud. Even last year, our legislature spent the majority of its time talking about how to make accountable these types of programs because they were having trouble with that. Last fall, we even saw the introduction of another school choice program that encouraged families to spend every single do dollar that they had within that program. So here we are. As a parent of, of special needs homeschool children, I get it. I get how expensive it is to provide an education for special needs kids. I've been there, done that. But because I'm a homeschooling parent with special with kids with special needs, I also know that the, term, the incredible determination and creativity that we have in providing what our children need often is not anything that's within inside the, the box of the public school world would ever think of. But you know what? We do it and it's successful. So opening public funding without sufficient accountability does lead to poor results and it also leads to ultimately regulation. We're also sympathetic to the families who've been, who've been failed by the public system. Every day our volunteers are tirelessly serving families who are in the exact same position. They've been failed by the school systems and they're wondering, would homeschooling better fit my child's needs? And you know what? Most of our volunteers were those parents. They were asking the exact same questions, not just a few years before. And they have answers and they're willing to help other families as they, they figure out what is best for their child. And we believe that the power of a home education and the ability of parents to make decisions for their child's education is, is very powerful, very strong, and we want to support that. <clears throat> and as new homeschoolers enter the ranks of our veteran homeschool families, 
I would ask that you please don't trade long established freedoms that we've had in the state of Indiana for a program that's administered by a failing system that you're currently fleeing. A new public program does not mean improved accessibility or improvements for your child, but I guarantee you it will mean picking curriculum from a pre-approved set of vendors who may or may not know anything about homeschooling or our curriculum in return for relinquishing your rights to your children's data, to your children's testing schedules, to your children's vaccinations, and any manner of other regulations that we've seen throughout the other states in the country. Remember, we're in the top five, so we've got 45 other states that are far more stringent and have higher regulation than we do. So that is not freedom. It is just another government system that you're going to have to figure out and, nav and navigate. Thank you for listening. I hope next year we can do this in person. I enjoy seeing everyone and all the usual faces, and I really hope that we won't have to worry about corona next year and we can do this face to face. Have a great day. Thank you for coming and listening. Bye. Are you enjoying the virtual homeschool day at the Capitol? The video content that we have available is premiering today live on Thursday, February 11th, but we're going to make it available for families to watch later on. But because you're here today and you are watching live with us, you have the opportunity to win a door prize. So here's how you do it. Take a photo of your family participating in our virtual event. Take a photo, a selfie of you together watching it. Moms, take a picture of your kids at the computer. Watch what we're doing. Then post it on Facebook using the hashtag IAHE hyphen capital day. We're going to give away two door prizes, one during the morning session and one at the end of the afternoon. So post your photos and let us know how much you're enjoying our virtual event. Thank you everyone for joining us for this virtual IAHE Homeschool Day at the Capitol. I am joined here by Indiana State Senator Jeff Rotz. Senator Rotz is from Richmond, Indiana and represents Senate District 27. He is the chair of the Senate Education and Career Development Committee. Follow the link in our description below to find out more about Senator Rotz. Thank you for joining us today, Senator Rotz. My, my pleasure, certainly, thank you. Um, our first question for you today, we would just like to know what drew you into becoming a senator and how you got started. We'll use some simple terms here. So um, probably back in uh, 25 years ago or so, so we're talking the mid 90s, uh, when I became interested on the peripheral anyway in politics and um, and then in about 2011, I decided that that was something that I would pursue. And uh, it took until uh, I, I looked very seriously at one seat in, uh, let's see, I suppose that would have been 2014. And to be totally honest with you, my wife said no. And because it's such a lifestyle change, I didn't realize how much it would be. Uh, for one reason or another, I listened and... Um, uh, it was a wise decision and a year later, that was probably 13, maybe it was 12, 13 or 14, uh, the incumbent uh, for the Senate seat uh, was retiring. And so the seat opened up and so uh, that, that obviously made it an easier path forward and uh, ran in a four-way primary and uh, emerged the winner and, and thus landed here. And, and uh, uh, it's probably one of the not probably one of the uh, most uh, significant things that's happened in my life. How's that? And it's really an honor to do what I do. Very good. Um, can you share with us one thing that you love about being a senator and one thing that you find really challenging? Uh, well, you can be as busy as you want. And I tend to like to, to do things. And so I have a very, very busy schedule. Uh, I pack myself with more things sometimes than I can handle. Uh, but I, I love being involved, and uh, so that's a negative. On the positive side, uh, I also uh, uh, need to engage with people, so I 
on a relational basis. And so for that piece of it, it it's really a huge blessing. And so uh, those two are, I would say both the, that's the positive and the negative piece. So. Now, um, I'm sure you know, but homeschooling has grown a lot over the past couple of years, especially the last year. And um, many of our homeschoolers may not really know what a senator does besides writing and voting on bills. And I know there's a lot more to it than that. Can you tell us a little bit of what your typical day looks like and what, what all you do? Sure. It usually starts uh, early on. And uh, so if, if we're not in session, if we're not uh, working on bills, uh, we're meeting with people. And so my day today, I, I had a couple free hours and almost don't know what to do with myself other than get ready for tomorrow, right? Or next week. But generally speaking, uh, we're busy from the time we get here until the time we leave. And if the, one day this week, I was, um, I mentioned to my wife, uh, you know, it was 10 o'clock at night. I was finishing up working on a bill for the next day and didn't watch TV or anything. When I was done, I I just shut the light out and went to bed. And so, um, if it were if it were year round, uh, we wouldn't, you know, we wouldn't probably be that way. But um, from a conservative standpoint, I think it's a great thing because uh, when we're here, we're working, and when we're not, uh, there's still all the constituent things that happen, all the events, the parades, the the meetings in the district. Uh, so, and, and then on top of that, we we do some traveling to. Uh, national uh, uh, gatherings, uh, like for myself, I, I'll go, now we didn't obviously this year, but I'll do two or three uh, national travels a year to go to um, learn about uh, education, what's happening in other states, what's what's training, what problems, how they overcame some of their issues. And so you, so you, you spend a lot, of, if you're going to be good at it, you have to do some travel and, and learn a great deal about what you're doing. And obviously, as you mentioned, education. So that's a lot of what I do. Uh, uh, so you, you if you're going to be good, you got to immerse yourself in it. I'm sure. Um, now, how has COVID changed your job has it changed it much? Uh, it has changed things uh, fairly drastically. Uh, we've been fortunate at the state house, but I, I would simply say uh, we've had to be flexible. Uh, the the Senate has done a great job. The staff have done a great job. We've not had any outbreaks or anything. Uh, so the the social distancing and distancing and things have worked here. Uh, we're doing a lot of Zoom meetings. I think folks uh, like we are today have uh, taken advantage of it in some respects. And so I I honestly have been more busy this summer since COVID hit till we got in session. I could combine two prior years together and I don't think I would as was that busy uh, just because it was every day, uh, two or three hours uh, while I'm totally off, uh, you know, not working in the district. Uh, so it's been very busy. Uh, other than that, uh, we're going right on down the road, doing the very best we can to keep moving forward. So I think everybody's been flexible. Uh, everybody's had to be flexible. Yeah, it's changed a lot for a lot of different people. Mm -hmm. um, another question that we have, um, how would you like to see your um, constituents more involved in government? I mean, what... Um, does having a relationship with their representative or senator make a difference? Uh, well, you, if you don't have a relationship, uh, let, me, let, me, let, me, let me back up and I'll say one thing. One of the, one of the greatest things I learned being in the General Assembly is from the outside, uh, we look and say, you know, on subject, whatever it is, if they would just do this, everything would be fine. And then you get in here and find out if we do if we do something. There's generally speaking a domino effect on other things that are affected by that specific thing. And so there's a lot of it's not as easy as it as it sounds, but it's still very practical. Uh, so that's the first thing I'd like to say. Um, but where you, when you're not voicing your opinion, uh, the legislators we don't we don't know how folks feel, and so. Uh, uh, a relationship is good uh, to express what you feel and, and the, the 
the answer is you can influence educate or, or uh, legislation. Uh, so we may get, uh, let's say on a, on a subject, uh, I can remember here in uh, several years ago in this office, we got like, a, we got 2000 phone calls over a weekend. Well, on a, on a controversial issue, uh, but generally speaking, if you send a, if someone sends an email, a personal email, not a cookie cutter, but a personal email, you'll get a response. And if, if even phone calls, you'll either get a response from our staff here or, or from myself uh, or, or other senators, uh, the cookie cutter approach doesn't work. And it, if we can identify, and be, because, you know, I don't want to say we don't hear it. We know that they're there, but the personal touch is far greater. Do you think um, for homeschoolers that are wanting to be involved, is it best to write a letter or send an email or make a phone call or are they all equally effective? I'd say they're equally as effective. Do you have any final comments for us today? I, I, I don't think so. I'm, I'm a fan of homeschooling and uh, I, I, I'm a fan of the right of homeschooling. And uh, I, I think uh, you know, true homeschoolers, Unfortunately, you get a bad rap uh, for uh, folks who uh, uh, are not true homeschoolers versus those who really are. And so uh, generally those students excel uh, in whatever uh, they choose to do. So uh, I'm a fan. Well, we appreciate all that you do for the state of Indiana and your service. And we especially appreciate you taking the time to speak with us today. No problem. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Enjoy your lunch. Thank you. <laughs> All right. We'll talk to you later. All right. Bye. Thank you for joining us here today for the virtual IAHE Homeschool Day at the Capitol. I am joined here today with Indiana State Representative Timothy Wesco. Uh, Representative Wesco is a homeschool graduate, husband, pastor, and firefighter, as well as representing House District district 21 and to learn more about uh, representative wesco you can find a link below thank you for joining us today representative wesco it's good to be on i'm so glad to join you all virtually today we um, appreciate you taking the time to do this and we would like to start off with you telling us a little bit about what your homeschool experience was like i'd be happy to so I was homeschooled all 12 years uh, and I uh, was one of 10, surprise, surprise, uh, with a large family. And uh, both of my parents were very engaged in our education. Uh, mom was an English major in college. And so she kind of focused on the, the reading, on the uh, literature, on that aspect of things. My dad was a electrical engineering graduate from Purdue University. And so he kind of took over the more science math related side of the instruction. We didn't use any one particular curriculum. We were one of those families that just uh, used a piece of this, a piece of that, and kind of built our own curriculum. And uh, overall, it was just a, a, a wonderful experience. And uh, we worked together in almost a a one room schoolhouse sort of manner where the older siblings would help teach the younger siblings. And so that was a very, most of the time, a very positive thing, although challenging at times. And so uh, I had an older brother that taught piano lessons, uh, an older sister that taught, taught phonics. And so I was one of the younger kids. And so got the benefit of, of that quite a bit. And so, um, I would, uh, I had a, I, I really enjoyed it. I had a great experience. I'm was so grateful for the opportunity to be homeschooled and uh, to have that, that flexibility, that freedom to spend that time with uh, my family. And uh, I'm so grateful my parents made that decision. Well, that's good. Um, we have, I've heard you speak in the past and I believe you became a state representative at a very young age. Is that correct? Yes, I was elected in 2010 at 24 years old. Wow. Can you tell us um, what that was like coming in at that age? Did, um, did your age affect your job or anything? Did you feel like it um, hindered what you could do or your influence or anything like that? 
Well, that's an interesting question because when I first came, I was the youngest guy in the room. And uh, in fact, my legislative assistant was older than I was when I came to the state house. And so he was a great guy. I enjoyed working with him. But there was a time I remember specifically getting up in caucus and uh, saying, you know, uh, I'm not sure I should speak up because I know I'm the younger guy. And uh, one of our other members who uh, still still serves us today uh, as our caucus chair now, in fact, he came up to me afterward and he said, look, you were elected just as much as anyone else here was. You have you represent just as many people. Your age doesn't matter. You need to be here and represent those people. So speak up and don't be afraid to speak up no matter what your age is. And so that was really encouraging to me. And I try to take that to heart. Now, just as a matter of, of wisdom, uh, I think the scriptures have a lot to say about being quick to hear and slow to speak amongst other things. And especially being a younger person, I think you need to be more sensitive to that because, uh, um, you know, there is a certain lack of experience there. So like Elihu in the book of Job, he waited until all the others had spoke, but he did speak his piece and uh, try to take that tact here in the General Assembly. And it's people, uh, I believe I've earned people's respect and uh, people do listen. That's nice that they encouraged you and you can when you're feeling maybe uh, whenever you would feel inferior, you could uh, look back at what he said to you. Um, so we would also like to know what was a big, your biggest surprise when you took on this job? What was something that you weren't expecting? Well, there were a lot of things uh, I think that I wasn't expecting. I had only been to the state house uh, a few times before I was elected for a couple of rallies and, and things like that. So I really didn't fully comprehend the broad scope of issues that we were would be dealing with in the General Assembly. Outside, uh, people in the general public are usually focused on a, on a few a few big issues and they think that's all the legislature talks about. But in fact, we deal with a lot of different minute, difficult aspects of the law. And even after serving in the General Assembly for so many years, there's still aspects of the law that I don't know a lot about. And I have to vote on legislation that, uh, you know, I can read, but I still don't necessarily fully comprehend the impact of. So. We have to work as a team, and that's something that I really I discovered quickly, that if we're going to be effective in serving the state of Indiana, we have to each develop our own areas of expertise, and we have to lean on our colleagues for, uh, for their expertise from their background, from the bills that they've, they've worked on. So just that collaboration, that teamwork uh, is so important, and it's something I learned early in the process. Uh, and I've learned to enjoy the diversity of issues that we talk about. Well, that's good. Um, it's certainly all the different, uh, I know from my lobbying aspect, seeing all the different committees and everything, it sure is a learning process. How has this year changed things with COVID-19? How is the legislative, um, the system different, how you handle things? What has COVID-19 done to change legislation in Indiana? So we're meeting in a different chamber over in one of our government centers, the government center south. So we're not actually in our house chamber in the state house. So that makes things feel very different. But the overall process of how a bill becomes law is still the same. We still hear it in committee. We take public testimony. It passes out of committee, second reading, third reading, goes to the Senate, same process, and then comes back to the House. That's all the same. I think because of the changes that we will probably not pass as many bills this year, which in my view is probably a good thing. Sometimes I feel like we're in a rush to pass too many bills. So uh, I, I foresee that being one of the lasting results as we don't pass as much legislation. I think we are looking at a lot of legislation that is in direct response to what has happened in this past year in as far as the pandemic, how it's impacted the economy, how it's impacted people's businesses, uh, how it's impacted education. Uh, and it's really exciting to see that all of a sudden educational choice was a, a big winner in 2020 because people realized, hey, look, uh, there are other ways 
to receive an education versus through one size fits all system. So I think there's going to be some lasting pieces of legislation that uh, make a big difference in our state going forward that are a direct result of this session and what we went through this past year with the COVID-19 pandemic. So you spoke about uh, not as many bills this session. Is each representative and senator limited to a certain number of bills? So in the past, the House members have always been limited to 10 bills in the long session, five bills in the short session. And the Senate always had the special privilege of being able to introduce unlimited numbers of bills. So we are still only at a 10 bill limit here in the House, but the Senate decided to also set limits this year to it in order to relieve the work pressure for our legal staff and also to recognize that uh, we're not going to be able to pass as much legislation this year. Now in committees, um, are they limiting? I thought I had read online on the IGA website that they were limiting the number of bills that could be discussed in each committee meeting. Is that right? Or is there just a time limit? They are limiting the, the, the committee meetings to a two hour hard time limit. And so that does limit the number of bills. In the past, we have had committee meetings go five, six hours sometimes. Uh, but largely it's because of a lot of people coming to testify. And I've generally noticed this year that there are fewer people testifying. So uh, a lot of the committees wrap up before the two hour break off time. So we're actually, we're, we're doing pretty well with that. As a, as a committee chairman, we like a hard deadline, frankly, because it gives us the ability to say, all right, you've only got so much time to talk. You can't just drone on and on and on about something. And also to encourage people, don't say the same thing somebody else said, just uh, uh, voice your support for what someone said or your view on the bill. Now, we would like to know if you have a fun fact about yourself or a memorable story that you would like to share. A fun fact about myself or a memorable story. Um, what would be good? Uh, one, one thing, uh, my wife was also homeschooled. And so uh, I met her back in 2004 and we got engaged in uh, 2013 I'm sorry, 2012, November, 2012, got married in 13. And uh, if you've ever seen the state Capitol building, there's the dome with the little cupola that sits up on top of the dome. And I was able to arrange to take her up there and propose to her. And so they ran a story in the Indy Star saying, taking political engagement to new heights. And so we got a, a newspaper story over our engagement. And uh, it, was a, it was definitely a great experience. Oh, that's very, that's a very sweet story. Do you have any advice or comments for the homeschoolers that are watching today? Well, first of all, I'm absolutely delighted that you're watching and that you're interested in what is happening in the state of Indiana and would encourage you to continue to be engaged. Your legislators are much more accessible than people realize, and I would encourage folks to develop personal relationships with them, even if you're very different politically, to seek to leave a good impression on your local legislator of what a homeschooler is and uh, seek to have a good relationship with them. And that gives you opportunities to influence what happens here in Indianapolis if you already have a relationship with your local leaders. So go to those town hall meetings, go to those third house meetings that are typically advertised uh, listen, ask great questions, go up and introduce yourselves afterward. Uh, it's, it's so good for legislators to have relationships with people before uh, we, there's a big bull, bill that everybody needs to oppose, right? If you have a pre-existing relationship and a good relationship with legislators, that can be so helpful. And it's a, it's a great educational experience getting to hear the issues and getting to know the people. So I would encourage uh, homeschool families to be engaged with their local legislators and continue to be involved. Well, thank you for that. And that's one of the reasons we have this homeschool day at the Capitol is to encourage families to get involved. Hopefully next year we can return to a in-person event. 
Yes, I would look forward to that. So it's always a day I look forward to. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us today and answer all of our questions. We appreciate your service to Indiana. Thank you, Belinda. It's been great to join you. Hello everyone. I hope you're still enjoying all of this fabulous content that our team has put together for you. The IAHE depends on the people that come alongside of us and volunteer their time and efforts. We are very much a volunteer driven organization and I am personally so blessed by their efforts. And today, because you're here, you are also blessed by all of their work. We also want to highlight some very important people who help make what we do possible. And I want to mention two of our sponsors, BJU Press and Ivy Tech Community College. We're very grateful for the support that they both provide to the homeschool community individually as families, the way that they want to help and serve you, but also in the way that they help and support us as an organization. They value what we do here and they value you as well. So make sure that you take the time to check out their links and visit their website for more information. We do have a video from Ivy Tech Community College that you'll find on your dashboard with a lot of great information about they, how they serve the homeschool community. So if you have a high school student or someone looking to do college, make sure you take the time to watch that video. And now we're back to all of our great Capital Day content. Good afternoon, Indiana homeschoolers. It's a great joy and privilege to be here with you today at your annual day at the Capitol. My name is Zan Tyler and I am a homeschool advocate, author, and speaker. I currently work with Homeworks by Precept and BJU Press Homeschool Curriculum. Joe and I homeschooled our kids for 21 years, and as they grew older and graduated, we started speaking more and more around the country, not just in South Carolina. And one spring, we found ourselves in Williamsburg, Colonial Williamsburg, one of our very favorite places uh, in the United States to visit. We were speaking at the HEAV Homeschool Leadership Forum there. And while I was speaking, Joe went and bought tickets for us to visit historic uh, Williamsburg after the leadership conference was over. Didn't take him very long. I was asking him about that and he said, the visitor center was really like a ghost town, which is so surprising. I can remember growing up and going to Williamsburg and there being thousands and thousands of people there and waiting in line for an hour just to get tickets. He said he talked to one of the docents there and said that, who said that since the uh, public schools quit teaching American history and the principles of government upon which our country was founded, that their attendance has gone down probably by 30% or more. That was really a wake up call for me because it made me realize that we are living in the midst of a country now that doesn't understand what their freedoms are and the principles of our founding fathers as they wrote things like our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution. So fast forward a couple of years, I was back in South Carolina speaking at a leadership forum, uh, and this was a civic and government program for up and coming leaders in the state of South Carolina. 
and I was the homeschool representative there. So after I spoke, there was a time of question and answer time, and a woman raised her hand and she said, Miss Tyler, don't you feel guilty for homeschooling? And I said, uh, I've had a lot of emotions of a, uh, over homeschooling, but I'm not sure that's one of it, them in the sense that you're speaking of. And I said, why do you think I should feel guilty? And she said, well, first of all, you're robbing the school district of the money they would get from the state for your kids being in their schools. Secondly, you're obviously an involved parent. The school district is losing that. And your kids probably have good test scores, so your school district is losing that. So I looked at her, I just am pondering this for a minute, and I said, who do you think my kids belong to anyway? And so as she was silent, I reached into the, my purse. You'll hear my story in a few minutes, but this is what my life was like. I used to carry uh, this little document around with me, and I wanna share it with you now, and this is what I re read to her in the group then. The fundamental theory of liberty upon which all governments in this union repose excludes any power of the state to standardize its children by forcing them to accept instruction from public teachers only. The child is not the mere creature of the state. Those who nurture and direct his destiny have the right, coupled with a high duty, to recognize and prepare him for additional obligations. This woman got real quiet she asked me where I got this information from, like she was sure it was right-wing propaganda. And I said, well, it was a Supreme Court decision, 1925, Pierce versus the Society of Sisters. So from these two stories that I'm telling you now, I learned that we live in a country where the citizens often don't know and value their rights anymore. And we live in a country that also doesn't understand our rights, our parental rights. And so they're suspect of our homeschooling. So it's in the midst of this context that we live and breathe and move. And we need to be aware of these things. In Indiana, you have a great homeschooling law. Tara Bentley, her staff and board at IAHE have done such a good job of monitoring the legislature, getting to know uh, legislators and keeping your good legal situation intact. You might ask, why now, when half the world is homeschooling, do we still need to be concerned about our freedoms? Well, first of all, we still live in a culture where people don't understand their freedoms. We live in a culture, like I said, they're unsure about your freedoms. We now live in a culture where if somebody doesn't like the way we're doing things, they just wanna cancel our right to do it our freedoms, our parental rights, the right to homeschool. And so rather than having free speech for everyone, we see, uh, and, and the ability to agree to disagree, we see a whole contingent of people that don't want you to be able to exercise your First Amendment rights anymore or your parental rights. And we also have to remember the lessons of history, like our Korean War Memorial says in Washington, Freedom is not free. Joe and I both have dads who are World War II veterans, and we understand the price that has been paid in this country for our freedoms from the founders on. Um, and then we have to look at the fact that the numbers are so high that we become a threat to the public school systems in many situations. So I wanna to talk to you a little bit about our rights and how valuable they are and why they're worth protecting and why it's worth your getting involved. The first is when I began homeschooling in 1984, I was threatened with jail by the state superintendent of education. My local school district had already turned down my application. It was about three or four inches thick and I had to give all this information to them, including a 36 week, 36 week syllabus, my fire escape plan, my lighting plan, uh, letters of recommendation from a doctor and a neighbor and all types of crazy thing. And after I did that, they turned me down. We had to hire an attorney just to find out what to do next. Nobody at the state department level or our local school district was willing to give us what the law actually was then or to tell us what came next. So we're hiring an attorney right and left to get us through this. 
And finally, I realized they said you're gonna have to appeal uh, your decision to the state board where they will rubber stamp the local school district decision. And I remember thinking that the state superintendent of education had been a friend of my mother's. When he was getting his PhD, she observed, he observed her public school classroom for several months. So I called him up and asked him if I could come see him and just tell him my story. And I said, Dr. Williams, I'm just a mother who loves my child. I've been denied um, the right to homeschool. Private schools are filled at this point in the summer, and I, I've had Ty tested. I really believe this is the best course for him. I was talking with a friend, and I'll never forget, he looked at me and he said, Zan, if you continue down this course, I will have you put in jail for truancy. And it was not an idle threat. Uh, I can just remember thinking, is it now against the law in this country to love your child and try to do what's best for him? But I remember thinking all of this is just going through my mind at the speed of light because I have to say something to him. And I'm feeling these emotions and trying to figure out how to handle the situation. And I really realized that this was my Patrick Henry do or die moment, give me liberty or give me death. And I heard me saying to Dr. Williams, well, you will just have to put me in jail then. And as I was driving home, considering the consequences of this, it really made me realize that sometimes we don't know what we have until it's gone. And that's certainly how I felt with my freedom as an American that day. And so the threat of jail for me set, set me on a couple of different journeys. One was I just needed to understand more about what our country had, built, had been built on. So I began studying the founding fathers in earnest, and I also began studying the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence, which were our founding documents. Mike Ferris, um, bless his heart, who was then president of Homeschool Legal Defense Association, really taught me with all the lawsuits we were involved in that the Constitution matters. And I'm not sure I picked that up in all my years of high school or college, but when the rubber hit the road, I needed to know those things. Um, Ronald Reagan said, freedom is never more than one generation away from extinction. We didn't pass it to our children in the bloodstream. It must be fought for, protected, and handed on for them to do the same. So we do have great freedoms right now, but we do have to remember that there are people who are always gunning for us. The, the NEA, um, as Mike Smith will tell you later on today, is definitely uh, not a friend to homeschooling or homeschooling parents. So we'll always have battles to fight and we just can't take those freedoms for granted, nor can we uh, take for granted that our children will know these things unless we teach them. Um, and, and to remember, as Ronald Reagan said, we are just one generation away from having our, our freedoms extinguished. Oz Guinness, who is a British author, wrote a book about America called A Free People's Suicide. He said, freedom is unquestionably what makes Americans, what Americans love supremely. And love of freedom is what American, makes Americans the people they are. Thus, the present crisis of sustainable freedom raises questions about the health of the American Republic that must be taken seriously. So we find our situation in the United States today where we have to fight for our freedom to make sure we don't lose it. We need to teach our children. We need to prove that the American form of government, our um, representative republic, is, is sustainable and doable. So I'm asking that today with me, you draw your line in the sand as a homeschool mom. This was not my job. This has been my calling to fight for homeschooling freedom. Just like you working every day in the trenches homeschooling your kids, but realizing we have got to be the ones that fight and care for our freedom. Um, like me, you might need to educate yourself. 
and learn more about the founding documents, the Declaration and the Constitution. Rick Green has some great uh, materials and classes he can recommend. HSLDA has a lot of resources in their bookstore and BJ you press uh, homeschool curriculum, has their heritage studies and government studies that are all based on having a uh, this worldview of freedom. So it, we need to invest in understanding our freedoms. We need to invest in the health of America. We need to teach these principles to our children and help them get involved as citizens. And we, this may mean that we are really walking outside of our natural comfort zones. This may be something you've never done before. So I would tell you, if you haven't been involved civically, treat it like any other subject. Learn it with your kids. Take the courses with your kids. Read the books with your kids and learn and grow together. Abraham Lincoln said, if we don't hang together, we might hang separately. And so I would encourage all of you, if you haven't done it, to join IAHE and thank Tara and that board for everything they've done to protect your freedom up until this point in time. Get involved with them. That's one step you can take. Take your children with you to vote. Vote in every election and take them with you. As soon as it's safe, take them in the voting booth with you, explain the ballot, explain the referendums, and explain the history of voting and what a privilege it is and how so many millions of people around the globe would love to participate in voting in an election. Get to know your legislators. Allison Gentala has done a great job of giving you many, many suggestions as to how to do that. And for some of you, that will really seem like a true leap out of your comfort zone. But as she says, invite them to speak at your support group or your local co-op. Or, you know, I, my suggestion during COVID has just been to write them a letter and send them a picture of your family, especially your particular representative or legislator and senator at the state level. If you're a constituent, you matter to them. And we need to make homeschooling personal. We need to put a face with it. They need to see your kids, how much you love them and how well they're doing. So get to know your legislators and begin to invest in freedom. Get involved in campaigns with uh, legislators and senators in your state who support homeschooling and pro-family issues, pro-life issues. Learn how to be involved in local politics. I can't tell you all the times my kids would stand out there on a street corner with me and we'd be holding up signs or posting signs or answering phone banks or hosting drop-ins. Your, your senator or your legislator will often go out on a limb for you. And in return, we need to uh, repay them by being involved in their campaigns and supporting them in the way they are giving to the community by serving. I would say be involved in local politics. Do you have a city council or a county council? Uh, go to school board meetings because even though we're not uh, having our kids in public school, we need to know the types of things that are being introduced there and being voted on. So I just wanna encourage you to remember that we live in a culture that is not going to always value our freedoms for us. So we need to take the initiative as homeschool moms to value and protect those freedoms. I wanna close by telling you a story that happened to me when I was in the middle of working on legislation, we had been fighting for about six years and finally felt like we had a solution to all of our legal and legislative issues. Mike Ferris flew down from HSLDA and one of my other board members attended and we met with David Beasley, who was the chairman of the House Education and Public Works Committee. And by the time I left this meeting, it was in December, prior to the beginning of a new legislative session. Uh, we really felt like we had a good plan intact. So as we walked out the door, I was walking Mike to his car as he left to go to the airport. All of a sudden, the enormity of the situation hit me and what it means to come up with a legislative campaign and the toll it can take on you personally and on my family and my kids. And I just burst into tears. 
And Mike said, you should be so happy about this. I said, I know Mike, but this has been a long journey and I'm tired and I'm not sure I have the shoulders to bear the weight of this any longer. And he looked at me and he said, sounds like you need a new set of shoulders to me, Zan. And he gets in his plane and I can remember walking to my car in the parking garage. It was cold and it was pouring down rain. And as I got in my car, um, just on the verge of tears again, I turned on the radio. It's December, it's Christmas. And uh, I turned on the car and the radio came on and the announcer for the Christian radio station was in the midst of reading this passage from Isaiah. And the government shall be upon his shoulders. And there and then the Lord reminded me that he was not only the creator of the universe, but Christ has the shoulders and the wisdom and the strength and the knowledge to bear the weight of our government. Our freedoms, our liberties, our government are upon his shoulders. And we just have the privilege of working and co-laboring beside him in an effort to protect our freedoms. So I do want to invite you to join me in fighting and preserving homeschooling freedoms so we don't see them uh, become extinct in one generation as Ronald Reagan and others have warned us. I wanna thank you for your time today. Make sure you get in touch with uh, with Tara and tell her that you want to join the cause. And I, I just pray that God will continue to bless America with liberty. Thank you. Good afternoon, I'm Mike Smith and I'm the president of Homeschool Legal Defense Association and it's my privilege to join you today on your legislative day. I wanna thank Zan Tyler who just spoke to you. Zan is one of the pioneers in homeschooling. She's been instrumental in being able to establish freedom to homeschool in her state of South Carolina and been very supportive of homeschooling all across the nation. I wanna thank IHE I-A-H-E, for giving me the opportunity to spend this time with you today. And I want to discuss with you from the national perspective how homeschooling freedom could be affected by what we see going forward, what our freedoms are, and how we can respond to them. But before I get into that, because I might forget to do this, and it would be terrible if I did, you live in one of the greatest homeschool states in America. Indiana has lots of freedom from homeschooling. You operate as non-public schools that are unregulated. One of the main reasons that you have this freedom is because of IAHE, your state organization, because they're very strong in making sure that the freedom you have now will be the freedom that your children will have. So they deserve your support. I wanna make sure you understand how important it is to be a part of IAHE. I don't know if they have membership. If they do, be a member. But you certainly need to support them financially because they spend lots of time monitoring bills, interacting with the legislature, and making sure that your freedom you have in Indiana is preserved. So let's talk about freedom. Let's talk about homeschool freedom, and let's begin with the national homeschool freedom issue. So the fact of the matter is the federal government, that's Congress, the Senate, and the President of the United States, should have no authority over your right to homeschool at all by law. 
The Constitution says that the federal government only has enumerated powers. Those are powers that are actually set out in the Constitution. Education is not mentioned at all. So they should have no power, no authority to regulate private and home schools or even public schools as far as that goes. But we know the federal government is very much involved in education, especially on the public school side. How does that happen? Well, there's a spending clause in the Constitution that allows the federal government to spend money for the general welfare. And so they spend billions of dollars on public education. So what happens when they spend billions of dollars? Then they're able to regulate public education. So as the government gives money, with that comes regulation. We all know that. That's how they basically have gotten control over public education in America. Although they only provide about 6% of the funding financially, about 90% of the regulations that our public schools deal with on a daily basis come from the federal government. Could they slip into homeschooling some way that way? Well, in 1994, a bill was introduced into Congress called the Elementary Secondary Education Act, which funds all of public education. An amendment was added to that bill, which would require all states to mandate that all teachers in that state would be certified teachers. Not only certified, but certified in every area of their particular, uh, that they were teaching. For instance, that they were a math teacher, they'd have to be certified in math, or a PE teacher, the same. So this would guarantee employment for all basically uh, students coming out of public schools that were graduating with an education degree. So we were informed about this bill by Dick Armey, who was in, the, in Congress at that time from Texas. And he asked us, does this bill impact you? Well, yes, since our homeschool teachers, our moms and dads are teachers. So we approached the author, this was an amendment to this bill, we approached the author, uh, Representative Miller from California, and we asked him just to put public school in front of teachers, and that would have solved the problem. But he refused to do it. So from that day on, for 10 days before the vote came, the homeschoolers of America, this is back in 1994 now, basically responded to this concern by over 1 million phone calls going into the Capitol switchboard basically shutting down the switchboard, shutting down Congress' ability to communicate with each other. And actually, the homeschoolers got their attention. So when the vote came up 10 days later, the vote was 410 to 1 against that amendment. It was voted down. Now, in that process, Dick Armey introduced a bill which says that the federal government has no authority over public or private education. So that passed as well. So the fact of the matter is the federal government should have no authority over homeschooling, but because of this spending clause, they could get some authority over homeschooling. So HSLDA will monitor vigorously any legislation, especially that deals with education, to make sure we can spot any efforts to get states because the federal government can't do it directly, but get states indirectly to regulate homeschooling. But what about the state side? Well, several Supreme Court cases have said that the state's interest in education is one of the highest interests they have. It's one of the most important things that they do. And so public education is deeply supported. Uh, where we live here in Virginia, 70% of our property tax actually goes to public education to support the public schools. Well, what about control over homeschooling? Because that's what we're interested in. Our freedom to homeschool is the key to our success in being able to offer our children an individualized and creative education and to be able to impart in them the values that we believe are important. For our Christian parents and religious parents, homeschooling gives them an opportunity to inculcate their children in the values, their values. So the freedom to do that is the foundation for being able to be a successful homeschool family. The states do have the right to regulate all education, which would include home education. But how far does that go? Well, it should be reasonable. But who determines that? Well, legislators introduce a bill. And this is the reason it's so important, again, to focus on supporting IAHE. Your folks there are experts. They have relationships with the legislators. Where this would come 
the threat to freedom, it would come in your state legislature. Now, the good news about Indiana is you're a trifecta state. Well, what that means is you have a Republican House, a Republican Senate, and a Republican governor. But the assumption is made that these folks actually support homeschooling. You see, homeschooling should, be, should not be a partisan issue. It should be bipartisan. We have homeschoolers on the left, the middle, and the right, all different kinds of homeschoolers. This should not be a politically divided issue, but it is in many states. But the good news is your state is very, very friendly in terms of your legislature, your governor, and you have two senators that support home education as well. But those relationships are developed by the folks at IAHE. They monitor all the legislation. Somebody could introduce a bill requiring teacher certification for homeschooling or to require curriculum that would match what is being taught in the public schools or standardized testing, for instance, some of the things that other states have. So they monitor, that's IAHE, they monitor that legislation, all legislation, to make sure that no legislation that would reduce your freedom to homeschool passes and they do an outstanding job. There's a real challenge to homeschooling today. Let's be honest, homeschooling probably has quadrupled in the number of homeschoolers because of COVID-19. On the other side of that, that's great, but on the other side of that are those that are saying, well, because of this, we know that there's lots of families that are getting involved in homeschooling that probably don't really want to homeschool. It wasn't their first choice. If the public school was available, their kids would be there. But now they're into homeschooling. Maybe some of them will continue to homeschool when everything comes back to normal, so-called. And they're saying those parents, those type of parents, are not as dedicated as you folks are that thought about it a long time ago. Or maybe you thought about it recently, but you're committed to it. Those folks are not, they'll say, those folks are not as committed. We need to regulate homeschooling. By regulating them, they will also regulate you. So we have to be real careful in this time to make sure that we do not allow that to happen. So are we gonna be able to preserve this freedom that you have in Indiana and the rest of the states? I say yes. That is if we'll be vigilant because we have God on our side. Now, why do I say that? Well, based upon my 40 years of experience, I have seen God intervene supernaturally to protect freedom all across this nation in the various states where we have gotten involved in cases in the legislatures and defending families. And why is that? Because God loves children. He loves your children probably at least as much as you do. And because of that, he wants you to exercise what I believe that God has given every parent the right and that is to be able to direct the upbringing and the education of their children in a way that conforms to their beliefs. Homeschooling provides that opportunity. And that's the reason it's a freedom issue. Let's face it, as we're looking at our country, as we're looking at the direction we're going, there is more and more dependence upon government. Uh, the COVID-19 situation has really accelerated that, of course. And many of us are looking for bailouts. People are now saying, bail me out. You know, I'm broke, I need help. The government is there to help. And that's how they view it now, to provide them money or whatever resources. So as we get more and more dependent upon government, government becomes more and more powerful. Because of that, there is the potential, there's the temptation on the part of those in government that are not crazy about home ed education to exercise their muscle, to begin to try to advance the regulation of homeschooling. And I mentioned to you the, the federal government. So what has happened uh, recently is we now have a Democratic con Democrat Congress, we have a Democrat Senate, and we have a Democrat president. Should that impact homeschooling? Well, I've already said it shouldn't because the federal government shouldn't. But the reality is there are issues around homeschooling that will impact freedom, especially parental rights. But what do we know about, um, for instance, the NEA, which has, uh, is pretty lockstep with the Democrat Party in terms of public education. So actually in preparation for talking to you here today, 
I looked at the Democrat platform to see what their statement on homeschooling was. There isn't any statement in there on homeschooling. There's a lot about public education and funding it. And what they'd actually like to do is start schooling at three years of age. Basically, they would uh, provide childcare and much more money for education, but nothing about homeschooling. But what we do know is their relationship with the NEA, the National Education Association, the strongest union probably in the United States right now, is that the NEA has taken a policy position on homeschooling many years ago, and they, re they redo it every year when they meet. And their resolution states the following about homeschooling. If they had a choice, there wouldn't be homeschooling in America because they believe that every child should actually be taught in public schools. But they know that, uh, you know, the cow's out of the barn. It's too far down the road. So here's their statement on homeschooling. Homeschooling could, should only exist as long as homeschoolers are abiding by the same curriculum requirements as in public school and teacher qualification requirements. Well, that would do away with most homeschooling. They also do not believe that any child should be taught by anybody other than a parent. No co-ops, no tutoring, only parent-directed education in homeschooling. And finally, that no money at all should be provided for private education, including home education. In other words, the government should not be able to subsidize a homeschooler's education. Actually, that may be the only thing that we agree with the NEA on, quite frankly, as it relates to education, especially home education. And so this is a threat. You know, I've talked about the threats coming in to take away our freedom, which are direct. That would be teacher certification, uh, college, re uh, college degree requirements for teachers, homeschool teachers, uh, curriculum requirements to match what's being taught in the public school, including maybe multiculturalism, et cetera, and testing. But this is the other way that our freedom can be impacted. It's through receiving government money. IAHE, HSLDA, both agree that we cannot allow this to happen in the homeschool community. Because once we do that, once we accept funding, we open ourselves up to regulation. And you say, well, the Democrats are not going to do that uh, because the NEA is going to basically tell them don't do that. But on the other hand, we have friends, and these are conservatives. They're part of the school choice movement. And they believe that, that children that are isolated and failing public schools should have an opportunity to take government money and go to a private school or a home school. And they would have that funded through the state. Many times these are called education savings accounts. They're not really savings accounts. They're money coming from the state to provide for education. Now, these friends that are actually trying to get this kind of legislation through in the various states, they are friends. We would agree with them on education and choice in education, uh, pursuing private education, homeschooling, advancing all of that. The one area we disagree with them is how to do that. We do not believe that government funding of homeschooling is in our best interest. As a matter of fact, we know historically it's not. All you have to do is look at the situation with the public school system. That's how the federal government basically got control over public education in America by providing the money. Mike Donnelly, one of our attorneys here, has said that with the shackles come the shackles. It is absolutely true. It may not be right off the bat. They may offer in the bill that the law will never change, homeschooling will always be protected, but nobody can guarantee that. The legislatures rotate every two years. So the areas that we can continue to be vigilant as we work in partnership with IAHE in Indiana and all across the United States, is making sure that we don't have any negative legislation that comes in that reduces your freedom and our freedoms. And secondly, that we don't pass legislation which gives money to private homeschooling. Well, it's been a pleasure to be with you today. I continue to support you. Uh, we love homeschoolers in Indiana. We love IAHE. And if HSLDA can help you in any way, we're here to help you. May God bless you. May God bless homeschooling in Indiana.
Hey, Indiana homeschoolers. I'm Rick Green, America's Constitution coach and founder of Patriot Academy. And it's an honor to be with you virtually through the camera here and through internet uh, at your Capitol Day. And, you know, this is a really important day. It's an important time for us as homeschoolers to be reminded of the importance of also just being good citizens, actually participating in our government. You know, our Constitution begins, we the people. Well, that means ultimately we're in charge. So if we want our system to be good, if we want it to reflect good values, then we have to be engaged in it, actually sowing those good values into our government as well. So I'm thrilled to be with you. I'm actually coming to you from the new Green Family Studios. So we've added a few things around here to be able to do more programs like this. And you're the first ones that we are sharing with from the new studio. So anyway, I'm, I'm enjoying uh, any opportunity I get to share with fellow homeschoolers across the country because I truly do believe that that you are the answer for America. It, it, it takes families that care enough about the education of their children that they're willing to invest the time, the money. Uh, many say a sacrifice. My mom always said when when people would stop her and say, wow, you homeschool, man, what a sacrifice. She would always say, no, it's an investment because it is. It's an investment not only in your children, but an investment in the next generation and, frankly, an investment in our communities, in our states, in our nation. Because as you raise good families, as you raise your children to be good citizens, to, to be knowledgeable about what makes a good society and good neighborhoods and all of those things, you're actually blessing other people as well. That's actually at the heart of what we call biblical citizenship, that, that if you're actually living out the Bible and you're applying it to every area of your life, including family, including how you work, including not just your personal spiritual life, but, but also how you are influencing your neighbors and, and the people in your community, when we live out the Bible in a way that we are true salt and light, that makes us the preservative. Salt is a preservative, but it also brings out the flavor. It brings out the best flavor. And so as homeschoolers, if, if we're raising our children to know these things, to have a biblical worldview, to understand their responsibility to be good citizens for the rest of their life and participate in this process, that's being a preservative, and it's also going to bring out the best flavor. We know uh, in our nation right now, we, we have a real problem with civic ignorance, just not knowing how the system works. So even for a virtual day at the Capitol, we're learning together how the system works. I, I, I used to, you know, I would always complain about people not reading the Constitution, and I, I realized that I didn't even know. And I was a legislator, I was a lawyer, you know, I, I political junkie, kind of live, breathe, and eat this stuff. And I was sitting in my Capitol office 20 years ago, and I was reading this poll that in Texas, my home state, that in Texas, barely half of Texans could name even one freedom out of the First Amendment. And 95% of Americans could not, I'm sorry, 95% of Texans could not name two freedoms out of the First Amendment. And I thought that was awful. But then I tried to name them, and I couldn't name them either. And I said, wait a minute, if I, I've been telling everybody else, read the Constitution. I, I'd carry around my pocket Constitution but I didn't know it. Well, friends, that's most of us in America. And the good news is, Tom Jipping says it this way, he says, ignorance is curable. We're all ignorant in some way, shape, or form. Doesn't mean we're dumb. It just means we haven't studied that particular topic. We don't know those details. And we have civic ignorance in our nation because we haven't taught that for so long. We haven't taught the basic foundations of what makes a good society and a good nation. And that's why your Capital Day is so important, because it, it puts an emphasis on this. It puts a focus on this for you and your family so that your children recognize, hey, it's important to pay attention to government. Uh, when, when you actually attend the Capital in person, and maybe you'll get to do that with us at Patriot Academy this summer, uh, but when you attend Capital Day next year, <laughs> hopefully at the Capitol, and your kids look around the majestic Capitol, they realize, wow, this is where, where government happens, and, and I have a voice here. I get to come here and, and, and testify in committee, or I get to vote for who's going to be my state rep or my, my state senator. What a, what a privilege that is to be able to choose our leaders. And when you focus on this at, at, at your day at the Capitol, it gives your kids a chance to learn that as well. And so I hope they're full of questions today, and I, and, and I hope that they're curious about how this whole system works and that they begin to learn that, and that today is just the beginning of that. I, I do want to talk a little bit specifically about being able to homeschool. Um, it's not, you know, we take it for granted, honestly. I remember as a kid, my mom, you know, when, when she was homeschooling us and, and, and mom and dad were kind of pioneers in this, along with a lot of other folks across the country, 
But man, you didn't answer the front door when I was a kid, when you were being homeschooled, out of fear of, of, of your parents being arrested, of, of truancy violations, and all the other problems before homeschooling really became um, allowed and, and frankly not frowned upon like it was years ago. And, and so I remember those days. So, so I take a day at the Capitol very serious for homeschooling families. And, and I want to encourage you to recognize that we didn't get here um, overnight and, and we didn't get here for free. I mean, it took a lot of sacrifice and a lot of hard work on, on the pioneers of, of homeschooling in, in states all over the country. And some states don't have very good homeschooling laws. You're blessed in Indiana to have fantastic homeschooling laws because you've had people like Tara and the whole team uh, that, that has been willing over the years to stand guard at the Watchtower of Freedom, to actually pay attention to what's happening in legislation every year and make sure that homeschooling is protected and, and to fight for good changes to make sure that homeschooling um, is not only protected, but it, but it's also not frowned upon, that, it, that, it, that, that parents that are homeschooling have, have their rights protected. So I just want you to stop for a minute and, and be thankful for those who came before us, for even those in the previous generation that, that lobbied the legislature for these laws and that fought for these things. And be thankful for the people that are, are leading the way in your state and, and that are helping to protect these things and then support them throughout the year, not just today for, cap for the Capitol Day, but also throughout the year. You know, pay attention to, to what's happening during the legislative session. Uh, Tara didn't ask me to do this, but, but I can't help but do it. I'm going to ask you to make sure that you consider donating throughout the year, not just one time, but, but support IHE because it takes money to do these things, to, to, to be able to be effective in this process. And, and that's for everything from the technology behind the scenes and, and being able to do emails and be able to have, keep uh, websites going and Facebook and all of those different social media tools and everything. It takes dollars to do that. I mean, let's just be blunt and practical about it. So please consider today, if this is your first time to do something like this, um, to be the beginning, but not the end, and, and that you'll be engaged throughout the year, financially helping, um, being there encouraging uh, the staff and the team and encouraging other families, getting other families to join. If you know homeschoolers that, that are not a part of the association, that are, that are not coming to things like the Day at the Capitol, then, then, then be a force multiplier. <laughs> Spread the word. Get other people involved as well. So I just want you to enjoy this day, but also make it a day where you commit to be more involved in the future, that, that we as parents and as citizens will do our part to preserve this um, and make sure that, that when our kids are grown, they have the options and, and they have the choice uh, to, to do education the way they see fit and, and, and not be harassed by government or uh, not be disadvantaged. And, uh, and, 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 and that, takes, uh, that takes vigilance, I'm telling you. All, all the things we enjoy in freedom can be lost like that. I mean, we've seen that over the last year. We've seen that in so many different ways. And so that's why it's important to, to stay involved. I'm telling you, those, those freedoms can be lost very quickly. So be thankful that you have freedom in Indiana like we do in Texas when it comes to homeschooling. Uh, there, there's a, a lot of reasons for that, but I, I'll be honest, the, the main reason is we both have great state organizations. Uh, you know, I'm blessed in Texas to have a fantastic organization. You're blessed in Indiana to have a fantastic organization. I'm, I'm telling you, without the Homeschool Association on the forefront, those freedoms don't survive because there's constantly people that want to take away your right to homeschool so they can force your kids back into the public school system because that means more money for them. It's not about your kid. It's about the money. That's what they really want. Now, there are some in that system that want your kid. They want to be able to teach your kid instead of you being able to teach your kid. Um, so that's another reason to make sure that we protect homeschooling. But I just can't say enough about the importance of having a good, strong association. You guys are blessed uh, to be able to do that. As you're looking at what, what's happening today, and I'm, I'm not familiar enough with the local policies uh, there in Indiana and the things that are going through the legislature this year, but I do want to encourage you to be vigilant and and make sure that you're you're tuned in to the association and seeking counsel and guidance on on you know when you call and talk to your legislator or go go meet with them. And look for opportunities to talk about those things together. Um, there, there's always new ideas. There's always new pieces of legislation. And sometimes it looks like a good idea and the unintended consequences have not been considered. And so by coming together and, and discussing these things and talking about these things, it really helps. It's that iron sharpening iron the Bible talks about. We're sharpening the countenance of each other, and it helps to make sure that we can prevent what appears to be a good piece of legislation that might turn out to actually um, end up hurting our, our freedom to educate uh, our children. So uh, be vigilant in that and make sure you're tied in uh, to the group. Um, so the last thing I really want to talk about is, 
is just making education fun. I, I want to encourage you, these, these, these days of the Capitol type events, it makes it real for your kids. You know, it's one thing to read about it in a, t- in a textbook or, um, you know, even on the internet, but it's another thing to go places and it's another thing to be around other people or to experience something like this. So even as your kids are watching some of these videos and seeing some of the things around the Capitol, I promise you it makes it more real for, for them. I, I know for my kids, we had the blessing of being able to travel a lot uh, uh, when they were young and actually go to the battlefields and the presidential museums and, and for us, the Major League Baseball parks but what you know just bringing history to life uh, actually making it real for them and that really helped them to kind of take ownership in their government and in their history so I want to challenge you to do that find ways to bring history to life to make civics fun we of course do that with chasing American legends that's a little uh, uh, TV special that we did as 12 episodes and we go to all kinds of historical sites around the country and we bring it to life for your kids and they kind of experience it with my children um, so they kind of see it through their eyes we have comedian Brad Stein so it's actually funny and and uh, and enjoyable so as you and, and I know a lot of you are first-time homeschoolers so I realize homeschooling is exploding right now because of what happened with COVID last year and if you're a first-time homeschooler I really want to encourage you to do that because you want to make education fun. You want your children to fall in love with history. I know I didn't love history when I was a kid because, you know, I just I just didn't. I mean, uh, I wasn't homeschooled my whole education. We homeschooled while I was younger, and then when I got into high school, um, I ended up going to a, a, a local school, and I'm telling you, man, they put me to sleep in history class and government class. My optimal learning position for those topics Head on the table, drooling when I woke up in the middle of whatever the, the teacher was talking about. Don't be like that when it comes to history and government. These are fun topics. America's story is amazing. So find ways to make it fun and entertaining. Of course, we're going to do that for you with Chasing American Legends. I encourage you to use that uh, with, with from the young children all the way up through, through high school. It's a great way to learn. It's a fun and entertaining way to learn. So be sure and check out Chasing American Legends. We have it at patriotacademy.com. That's our main website, patriotacademy.com. That's also where you can get signed up to come back. If your uh, kiddos are 16 and older, then they can be part of Patriot Academy this summer at the Capitol where they actually get to serve as a legislator. So instead of just watching from the gallery a legislative session, they're going to be the ones in the chair debating the issues of the day. They're going to be the ones in committee debating those issues. It's a really fun way to learn the process. So check out patriotacademy.com. We'll be coming to your capital this summer. Lord willing, if all the all the COVID crackdowns are finally over, uh, but it's a great opportunity, patriotacademy.com. And that's also the place you can get Chasing American Legends or our government class. We actually have a high school government class called A Republic, if you can keep it. Again, making the topic fun and entertaining. We put over a million dollars into the production uh, of, of the different videos that we use in that uh, government class. So it's a great way, again, for your kids to learn what their government's all about. And you know they don't have to be in high school. I mean, it meets the high school requirement for government and it does prepare them for the CLEP test if they want to go take the CLEP test and get that three hours of college credit. Uh, But we have students seventh and eighth grade that that take that class as well. Designed for high schoolers, but again, we have some middle schoolers that do it as well. So a lot of things like that available at our our website, patriotacademy.com. And then email us and let us know if there's any way we can serve you as as homeschoolers. I mean, we we want to partner with you as parents. We want to partner with you to, to raise good citizens. Because I'll tell you, I may be here in Texas, uh, but I'm telling you, as I raise my children, uh, it's going to impact your life the way that we raise our kids. How you raise your kids is going to impact my life, even though you're in Indiana and I'm in Texas. We're in this together. And so we want to team up with you. We want to lock shields with you, if, if you will, um, and, and make sure that, that we're all doing a good job to raise up that next generation, to raise up a remnant. And, th- and that's what I see happening in the homeschool movement. It is a remnant that God is raising up. I believe to save our nation, to bring us back to a, a biblical foundation. And, and one of the things that, that you might may want to participate in, it's a free offering. It's called Biblical Citizenship in Modern America. Uh, it's a new program that we just created this year. It, it uses our Constitution Alive, the Constitution class that we've had over 100,000 people go through. But it also ties that in with biblical citizenship. We've got Kirk Cameron in it and Matt Staver and Rabbi Daniel Lappin and David Barton, Tim Barton. A lot of other folks uh, are a part of that program. It's called Biblical Citizenship in Modern America. And you can do that with your homeschool group. You can do that with uh, at your church or just in your living room with your family. It's a great way to learn what does the Bible say about our role as citizens? How do we do this dual citizenship thing where we're citizens of heaven, 
but we're also citizens of earth. How do we live out a biblical worldview, biblical application of being a good citizen? Those are the kind of things that we need to be talking more about and learning and actually implementing. That's what will save our country. And so that's why we want to come alongside you. We want to equip you. We want to get you as many tools as we can to help you raise up those biblical citizens. Thanks so much for being a part of the day at the Capitol. Thanks for being a part of IHE. And and I encourage you again, don't let today be a a, a one-off. Make sure that you stay involved throughout the year. And then as you get more engaged in this process, I promise you there's a lot of families around you that are looking for something like this. They're, they want to homeschool. Uh, they want to be able to benefit in all the ways that homeschool benefits a, homeschooling benefits a family. They want to be able to do it, but they're kind of afraid to do it. So as you're learning this, if you're new or if you've been around for a while, what an opportunity to multiply, to be a force multiplier, to share this, this freedom and share these rights with your friends and neighbors and people at your church. They're hungry for it. Be one of the ones that that passes it on to them. God bless you guys. Look forward to seeing you hopefully this summer. I hope you have a phenomenal, phenomenal day at the Capitol. Rick Green from Patriot Academy. We'll see you. What an amazing and encouraging message from Rick Green. And Zan Tyler and Mike Smith and Linda Hobart and Allison Gentala and Allison Slatter and all of our teens and our lobbyists, so much great information. I am so glad that you were able to join us today. Again, we wish we were all together in person, but what a fun, unique day we've had together. So I'm so glad that you took the time to hang out with us and learn more about how you can be a part of protecting homeschool freedom here in Indiana. We hope that you've learned a lot of new ways to connect with your legislators. If you have any questions or any input, be sure to send it to us. We're so grateful for everyone who took part in putting our event together today. Our amazing volunteers, our sponsors who helped make all of this happen, and we're just so grateful that you have been a part of it. So make sure you stick around just a little bit. Watch those amazing credits. Find out about all of the people who have helped put this event together today. And we look forward to seeing you again in person, hopefully sooner rather than later. (laughs) 